Hello and welcome to New Economic Thinking. I'm here this afternoon with Professor Sanjeev Goyal, the head of the Faculty of Economics at Cambridge University. Sanjeev, thanks for joining me today. So um, your main study is uh, the uh, is network theory, which is a relatively new uh, area for economics. Um, it's often said that um, we're all um, connected to each other via six degrees of separation. Do you, do you, th do you think network theory actually proves that uh, truism? <laughs> well, yes, I think in some ways, um, uh, this actually goes back a long, long time. Uh, so in the 50s, some mathematicians proved some very powerful, simple theorems which showed um, if we were randomly bumping into each other, we would uh, be actually very close to each other. Um, but I think it's fair to say that we don't randomly bump, bump, you know, bump into each other. We grow up in communities, we have families, we go to schools, we make friends who then connect us to their friends. Um, and uh, there's a sense in which um, that earlier mathematical model of how randoms, how random networks are, is probably not uh, very appropriate for thinking about um, how networks in the world uh, evolve, how they are formed. Um, and indeed, um, one of the key uh, ideas that we have uh, we've developed in the last 20 years or so of research um, in economics, but also in sociology and in physics, um, is, is that uh, there is more to it than the six degrees. And, uh, so what is the right way to look at economic, uh, the, uh, the network theory in that case? Uh, there's more to it in the sense that um, I think the, the big takeaway, if you, if you like, is um, I think I'll talk about this as an economist. So I think as an economist, one is used to thinking about um, small number problems as we do in game theory, where you have firms, two or three firms which are competing. Or we have competitive general equilibrium, which has anonymous settings with large numbers of players. Um, but actually, if you think about it for a moment, you realize that we, lit, we, we, we live in a world where we have these giant firms, we have big countries, we have, uh, on the other hand, we have our social networks. We have our small communities, our groups of friends um, and relatives, and it's this space which is, um, in a sense, this, this idea that we have, we mix with a few people who in turn mix with a few others. And so it's this space between the small numbers and the large anonymous crowd uh, that networks are you know, naturally uh, mapping, naturally uh, capturing. Uh, both the small numbers in the sense of the number of people we know on Facebook, you might know 200 people, uh, I know that, Marshall, you know many more people uh, on Facebook than the average person on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook for the record, but, uh, but, but, it's a, but, but you know the average people. person probably knows yep. two or three hundred people. Yes. And yet, Facebook has, you know, over a billion people. And most people are indirectly connected. So I might know you, and you might know X, and X might know Y, and therefore I know Y indirectly through you. And that the distance between me and an, you know, a random person picked in Facebook is actually going to be quite short. And that's a sense in which this um, six degrees of separation or the small world idea is, is sort of true. Um, okay, and so it is, it's a very deep point uh, you know, that it, it is true now and now we know empirically that it is true. It's true empirically, and, and uh, so it's, it's a very comforting thought to know that we uh, are, are more connected perhaps than we thought we were, whether by Facebook or in other matters. But, uh, so what, what do you think are the economic implications that uh, flow from that insight? So let me go back a bit and, and, and to, to, to answer your question, go back a bit and, and talk about how I started thinking about networks, right. because I think this is going to uh, make it a little more concrete. So many years ago when I was doing my PhD at Cornell in the late 1980s, the study of information economics was really in its heyday. Um, and, and so when you don't have information, you might buy information. You can buy information by paying some uh, cost. Um, and the thought I had was that if it's costly to acquire information, I might you know, turn to my neighbor or my friend 
and also ask him or her, well, maybe you can tell me what you found out. Pool resources. Pool resources. Now, you, you might think it's a little strange, but at that time, the, the way economists thought about uh, information acquisition or learning was either a person doing it all by himself in isolation or in an anonymous competitive market. Mm. Uh, there was actually no space for this social learning, uh, which takes place among small groups, which are overlapping, and they span societies. Uh, and so this is where I started thinking about, in fact, social networks and um, information economics and, and learning. So when you write down models where people are making choices, learning, sharing information, learning from each other, uh, but a small subset of people who are learning from others in turn, uh, you are led naturally to ask questions about how does the structure of the network affect the learning? Um, how, do, how does the structure of the network affect spread of ideas? Um, and it turns out that in the early 90s, I did some work which essentially showed that at a high level, this notion that people have, the wisdom of crowds, you know, that many people, if they get together, their average opinion will be broadly true, will be broadly correct. This basic insight is only true in networks which don't have very, very highly connected hubs. Mm -hmm. Because these hubs can bias the learning of the whole crowd. Um, and if you now think about what does it mean for a network to have hubs, um, in fact, it takes me back to your question of, uh, the small worlds. Because if you think of a network, um, I'm sure you opened an airline book when you're flying, you know, in one yep. of your many journeys. Um, and you will see that most of these networks are, have a hub spoke structure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want to fly from here to London, you would probably go to New York, and then, you know, you will fly from there. And we all have to go to New York to go somewhere. We can't go from point A to point B, we have to go through New York. New York is a hub. But you see what it does, uh, a network like that, if you had 100 cities and New York is a hub, it would have roughly 100 connections because each city will be linked just with New York. Mm -hmm. So each city will have roughly one link. But the distance between the cities would be very short. It will be two because you just go to New York and from New York you would go to the city, the other city. Now, this is a general property of networks, this idea that you have these hubs. So if you go on Facebook or you go on Twitter, you have people who have 5 million or 20 million followers. These are the New Yorks of the Twitter. Mm -hmm. But what, this, what happens in this community is that these people who are hubs can have a disproportionate influence on the community. Uh, and so the wisdom of crowds can break down. Uh, so that's one example where the small world idea, which is very salient, it's an empirical fact of many networks that we see around, airline networks, Twitter, uh, infrastructure networks, uh, social networks, um, and financial to, and, networks. And to continue the, 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 the airport, airport analogy, airline analogy, I, I presume then uh, just as uh, someone who had uh, too many followers might uh, influence the wisdom of crowds disproportionately, an airline that had control of too many of the hubs would uh, impact on the areas of, say, aviation competition. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. So one could ask whether these hub spoke structures are anti competitive. They, they deter entrance, small firms, for instance, small airlines entering local loops. Uh, and there is actually very interesting work which shows, you know, how once you regulate airlines in the face of this essentially free skies policy. Uh, you know, earlier you couldn't have these, uh, you know, hub-spoke structures because you had restrictions on where you could fly. Uh, so, but more generally, if one, you know, takes a step back and asks what is perhaps a very general insight of the, the work on networks, it is this that many of these networks have small world properties, which means that you can go from any point to any other point uh, with very few um, jumps, very few uh, loops. And that's because you have these hubs. 
They and bring the world together. Do you, th do you think uh, networks in some ways, or the, the creation of networks is in some ways antithetical to capitalism? In, and I, I'm thinking not only of the airline example, I'm also thinking, for example, of the deregulation of the, the, the telecom, te te telephone networks. So you had all these um, baby bells that were uh, broken up uh, in theory to create competition, but of course eventually uh, they were, uh, started gobbling each other up. In a sense, uh, that would be the the analogy. Of the airline would be a, an airline that managed to get control of a number of uh, of hubs, so that they're concentrating their economic power. And in, in the in the telecom case, you would be essentially replacing a public monopoly with a private monopoly. Yes. So, uh, so, so I think you are now moving on to the next sort of big question here, which is when you allow airlines or big, you know, economic players free way, you know, to, to, to set up networks. What kinds of networks are going to arise? Are they going to be dominant players, if you like, anti-competitive and, and so on? So this has been a very, very major theme in the economics literature. The idea being simply that uh, it's known as network externalities. Mm -hmm. And the idea being simply that if many of us join a platform, many of us join Facebook, it becomes even more attractive to join Facebook. If many of us write programs for Microsoft, it becomes even more attractive to buy Microsoft Windows because there's so many programs. Mm. But if many of us join Microsoft, it becomes even more attractive to write programs that run with Microsoft. So there is a winner-take-all logic mm -hmm. to these systems. There is a sense in which um, that is also uh, at play in this hub sort of uh, world. Uh, when people start joining you, it becomes more attractive for others to join you. Uh, and you become more and more attractive, the increasing returns. So these big ideas in economics of you know, increasing returns and therefore anti-competitive pressures, a winner-take-all sort of dynamics, certainly are at work in the world of it's a It's a fundamental tension. Uh, and and how, how does one resolve that? Uh, so, so one of the things we... So in the 90s, you know, when I wrote down these models on social learning and, and, and I first started thinking about how hubs might bias social learning, uh, I began to also then ask myself, well, maybe these networks never arise, so we shouldn't worry about them. Uh, so I then started thinking of writing, then I started thinking of how networks form and wrote down some early models of formation of networks. You know, you, I can form links with you, uh, people can form links with each other. What's going to happen in this environment? Are we going to get flat, dispersed communities, or are we going to get very centralized, hub-like structures? And one of the key insights of that work was, indeed, that for a very large class of environments, there is a, there's a great pressure towards these hub, uh, hub-spoke structures, uh, which are exactly, you know, the kinds of structures where you get dominance mm -hmm. and where you get increasing returns. So there is a sense in which the, you know, those small worlds arise when you have these hubs. Um, and when these hubs are around, they can actually have disproportionate influence on the functioning of the system. It's no longer a random mm -hmm. interacting system, but it's actually very structured. Um, and on the other hand, the logic of the system actually pushes towards a structure which is exactly like that, the hub spoke system. So, so that those are, I would say, some of the ideas that have emerged, you know, from from the from what we have been studying over the last uh, 10, 15 years. It, it has certainly has implications as well in in finance. Uh, the the financialization of our economy. Uh, in, in many respects, lends itself to this uh, network type of analysis. In fact, arguably, the Dodd-Frank legislation that flowed out of the, in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis um, helped to uh, it, it sped up this network effect in the sense that, if you like, the, the major banks became the hubs insofar as they became the primary uh, uh, deposit aggregators, uh, which does again create anti-competitive pressures, creates a too large to fail problem, um, and, and it perhaps disproportionately uh, hurts the smaller community banks as an example. Yes, yeah, so, so I think, uh, so financial networks are a leading example of exactly the structural property in the sense that many financial um, networks have what is known as a core periphery structure. 
uh, which is just a more technical way of saying what you were saying, which is that you have a few large banks which are very densely interconnected amongst themselves. They constitute the core. And there are hundreds of small, maybe regional banks, community banks, which have links with a few of these core banks. Mm -hmm. So you see this, if you like, a generalization of the hub spoke structure, the core periphery structure. So many papers have been written on this financial architecture. And indeed, you can see uh, in some recent work I've done, uh, you can ask what are the incentives of these banks to take risks. Uh, and, and one of the insights, one of the uh, takeaways from this new work I've done is exactly that these, when you have these hubs, uh, core periphery structures, um, you actually find that the banks at the core have a disproportionate uh, incentive to take risk. And so much so that um, it could actually lead to very large systemic risk of the system when you have these core periphery structures. Uh, so, so I think this is in different, very different ways and very different contexts. Mm -hmm. This idea of very heterogeneous, very unequal networks, um, small worlds, is playing itself uh, through. Uh, you know, in, in very different contexts: social learning, financial networks. Again, illustrating how the network structure amplifies and 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 very dramatically shapes the aggregate dynamics. Of these systems. So is the answer to uh, mitigate the uh, growth of these networks, is that, is that even possible? Would that be the way that you deal with this problem? So, Assuming you want a, a free market capitalist system, let's make that as, as, a, as a given assumption. So, it's, so, I, so let's actually take um, a story that uh, you, probably, you probably remember. So there was this, uh, you know, there was this um, online network, Second Life, and there's another one, MySpace. And they were around. They were around actually, I think, around the same time, maybe even before Facebook. And they were very large. Uh, I have many friends who had accounts on these. Uh, uh, many years ago, I went to a, a very well-known conference that Unilever runs every year called Spark, where the question was, is it good to advertise on MySpace or on the beach? And, well, MySpace has disappeared. It's around, but nobody really notices it. Facebook has taken over. So what do we learn from that? Well, maybe the dynamics of capitalism are such that you know these platforms are there, they are very powerful, but actually they could get, you know, they are replaced by other equally powerful um, disruptor networks. So it's not, uh, one cannot make a general case that there is, um, you know, that they are there to stay, they are, they, they, they are necessarily um, permanent. Uh, but it certainly does introduce another variable, and I guess an understanding of network theory, hopefully, will help to uh, construct a wiser and more sensible policy, given uh, the way we understand it today versus, say, 20 years ago. I guess that's the, that's the hope, anyway. Yes. You know, I think uh, what... What we are learning, just to go back to the example of financial networks, is that, um, as uh, some, some economists have said, that we may sometimes want to focus not on too big to fail, because if you are a big player but you are all by yourself, you really can't cause that much damage. But if you are a, a player who's very well connected and you go under, mm -hmm. you could create, there could be cascades and there could be much more systemic risk. So there is a very important policy message here, a very general policy message that it's worth learning the structure of the network because then you can target your energies on the key players. You don't randomly pick people. And on that note, I think that's a very good point to uh, end a constructive note. Uh, Sanjeev Goyal, thanks very much for joining me today.